Okay, hello, hello everyone. Um, thought I'd do a slightly different video this time. Um, I went racing at the weekend uh, at a track that a um, few people who race in the UK might have uh, been to before. Just thought I'd give a quick rundown of uh, how things went and what I changed on the car um, and what effect I thought uh, the various changes I made had. Um, so uh, the track I went to was uh, it's called Millais. Uh, RC circuit races. It's a club down uh, in the south of England, uh, not far from Gatwick Airport, so um, it's kind of south of London really. Um, really nice little club, very well organised. Um, it's quite a small track, so I, I think it's probably about 18 metres long and 12 metres wide, the track area, so six rolls of carpet, um, but which is kind of typ typically maybe a roll a roll narrower than what we'd have at a national event in the UK, um, but certainly um, not as long. So yeah, 18 metres long is probably 10 to 12 metres short of what we would say is a, a national level grade uh, track area. Um, but what I will say is the, the track there is very, very nicely constructed. Um, the carpet is grey Prima Felt carpet. Um, so kind of, slightly more old school in the type of carpet they have there. Um, for anyone who races in North America, it's probably similar to the kind of light gray Ozite stuff that you have at a lot of clubs overseas. Um, so that type of carpet typically um, starts off quite low grip, low traction, um, but builds quite consistently as more and more cars run on it. Um, and yeah, once once a reasonable base level of grip is established on on that carpet, the, the cars feel really nice to drive. They're very very progressive, not twitchy or or super high bite. So you can um, you can really kind of dial a car into it, um, and and small changes that you make to the car have a noticeable effect on the way it drives and the way it handles. So it's a really Millais is a really good uh, club for doing kind of set up development work um, and the nature of it being quite small it's very tight narrow twisty um, it's really good for keeping your thumbs uh, sharp and uh, working on your driving precision and consistency so in eight minutes we were doing uh, in excess of 40 laps um, so it's quite a long lap really it's just over 11 seconds was a fast lap um, so on a track area that small, that's that's pretty twisty. Um, but yeah, difficult but challenging and, and good fun nonetheless. So before I went to the uh, the race, I was kind of aware of the circumstances, what kind of carpet it was, what the track layout would be. Um, so I made some kind of informed decisions before I arrived about how I'd prepare and set the car up. Um, so I've had a lot of questions lately uh, on from people asking what tyres I use. Um, so for the most part in the UK on our on our tracks, our carpets and, and the additive we use, which is typically kind of uh, the Spider Blue uh, additive um, or variants of Spider Grip uh, additive. Um, I quite like hot race tyres, Hagberg compound. Uh, they seem to work pretty well, um, and I know um, he won't mind me mentioning, but Dave Spashett uh, also likes to use these tyres. Um, the wheels are very stiff on them, um, which means they are a little bit fragile, so if you have a whack with the car, uh, the wheels are liable to, to crack um, some of the time, but um, generally speaking, they're pretty consistent. Um, yeah. This is a good good all-round tyre to use in, in our grip. Um, the other option I have in my armoury is um, Ulti XM or X Medium compound. So that's more of a, a synthetic uh, high grip um, type foam. So that seems to, in comparison to the Hot Race Hagberg tyres, which kind of make the car feel quite free um, and the, the Hot Race give you lots of feedback through the car. So you make small setup changes to the car running hot race Hagberg tires and you, you get 
very noticeable change in, in the car behaviour, um, which allows you to assess the, the kind of effect that small cha small changes are having. Um, the difference with Ultx mediums, I find they're quite similar to like a JFT S foam. Um, I find that they tend to lock the rear of the car in more. Um, so if you're running on a track that is low grip, low traction, not many cars running, um, typically an Ulti X medium or, or a JFT S35 is possibly a better choice of tyre because um, it will lock the back of the car in, uh, make it feel like it's stuck to the track more. Um, so you won't feel like you're fighting the car, particularly when you want to get on the throttle, if you're running a spool or a solid rear axle, um, kind of S, S35 or Ulti XM tires um, will, will make the car feel safer and easier to drive. But the drawback is that they don't give you as much feedback and as much feel in the car. So um, what tends to happen with that type of tire is that you'll put it on the car and the car will drive to a pace or or have a particular feeling and, and you might find that you make changes to the setup, the mechanical setup of the car, and you can't really feel what effect they're having on the track because the car is just stuck to the carpet a lot more. Um, so for that reason, I, I tend to, when I can, I tend to prefer running hot race Hagberg tyres. Um, I will run Ulti X mediums if if I'm at a track that's very low grip. So I decided before I went to Millet's that I'd, I'd choose hot race Hagberg and I'd stick with those for the day. Um, the result of that was I went out in the first, first round. Uh, the track was very green, quite dusty, low grip, and the car was very, very difficult to drive. Really loose on the rear end, um, was quite unpredictable, difficult to place on the track. Um, but I knew in the back of my mind that the track would come to the car, so I wasn't too concerned. Um, although, yeah, in those, that first run and probably the, the second run as well, I did struggle. Um, and yeah, it was. I did think to myself at the time that if it was possibly a less experienced driver uh, driving my car, then they'd have really had a hard time of it. And maybe a, an Ulti XM or, or an S35 JFT tyre would have been better for them. Um, but as the grip built in the track, um, obviously being a small track, very twisty, there were quite a few cars running. Um, the grip level was built to a reasonable level. So by the third or fourth run of the day, um, yeah, the, the, the car on the Hagberg tyres was, was nicely locked in and I could then start leaning on it a lot harder and driving it um, a lot more precisely and, and closer to the boards and turning some fast laps, so that was good. Um, what I also started on was um, inline axles on the front of the car, um, which in hindsight was a bit of a mistake. Um, I chose inline axles with a minus six front wheel front uh, plate on the suspension um, because I thought there, there were likely to be lots of fast direction changes on the track. Um, so I wanted a car that would, well, I thought I wanted a car that would bike quite hard initially, get into the corner very quickly. Um, but yeah, as, as I previously mentioned in the low grip, it was almost undrivable, very, very difficult, very twitchy around neutral. Um, and I didn't feel very comfortable with it with it at all. So after the first run, I switched over to uh, trailing axles on the front, coupled with uh, the ZT Carbon, which is essentially a minus three plate. So in, in making that change, I didn't actually change the wheelbase of the car. Um, I just changed the trail on the axle. So I went from a minus six plate with inline axles, which gives minus six wheelbase shift backwards and then the axles are in line. From there I went to the ZT plate or the minus three carbon which moves the suspension back three millimeters but then also the trail on the axles moves it back a further three millimeters. So overall the car was six mil shorter than what we call the zero position. So switching between inline and trailing didn't change the wheelbase just changed the axle. Um, and the intention of switching to those trailing axles was just to calm the car down a little bit initially, um, but I was hopeful that it would pay me back with a car that would turn harder in the middle of the corner. Um, 
which it certainly seemed to do. Uh, after I fitted the trailing axles to the car, it, it did smooth it out a lot around neutral, made it track uh, better on the straight. Um, and yeah, it was the car was easier to place on the corner entry, so, so that was good. Uh, what I also did on the front, uh, I was running C1.1 uh, front springs, which is our kind of base setting in the UK. Uh, what I did do was I measured the droop of the front and I, I kind of felt as though I had too much front front end droop. So usually we like to run between 0.2 and 0.3 of a mil of, of front droop. I probably had half a mil to 0.6 perhaps of front droop, which I felt was a little bit too much. So um, I just added a, a 0.2 millimeter shim to the kingpin build just to add a bit more preload to the front spring, reduce the droop. Um, so yeah, if I measure the droop now, hopefully it'll be somewhere in the ballpark of what we like to run normally. So this the car, incidentally now, as you see it, is as it came off the track, I've just blown the dust off it. So um, this is how it finished the, finished the main or the final on Sunday. So if I measure the ride height, that's, that's about 3.2 at the front there. If I just lift the front, measure again, Yeah, that's just under 3.5. So I reckon I've got about 0.25 of a mil of, of front droop there, which is pretty much where we like to run it. So that's good. So that was the front end. Uh, moving further back slightly, um, I played around a little bit through the day with uh, the, the side rail settings. So usually we run an M3 by 6 uh button head screw in these side rails in the most forward hole so that's kind of the softest setting uh, for this leaf spring on the side here so you've got a, a longer lever a longer leaf spring essentially so that basically softens the rear end but we do also play around with the preload that that these springs have uh, applied to the the side rails on the outer chassis um, usually we we set the preload on these with the thickness of the washer that we have under the head of the screw. Um, quite a good base setting is to have a one millimeter spacer under here with an M3 by six button head screw screwed all the way in. And that usually gives just under two millimeters of gap at the back of the side row here. So if I measure the gap between the side rail and the, the outer chassis, it's usually just under two millimeters if I've got a one mil shim here. Now it's important to note that very very small changes to this the spacing under this screw can have a big effect further down the rail at the back here um, on the gap and the gap between this side rail and the outer chassis is quite critical in the balance of the car and, and how it behaves so base settings about just under two millimeters of gap um, i actually reduced the spacer thickness here um, in an attempt to make the car turn harder, have more steering, be, be more on the nose. Um, so if I measure the, what the gap is here, just with my ride height gauge, usually I'd use a feeler gauge for this, but just for ease in, in this instance, I'll use my ride height gauge just to get a feel for roughly what it is. I reckon I've got about 2.4 millimeters of gap under here. So I'm running, the gap here is probably half a millimeter larger than than what we'd have as our base setting in the uk so that's quite a big change um and certainly when i when i made this change i went out on the track and the car definitely was more responsive more direct felt like it had more steering better rotation in the corners um but if you're going to make a change like this to the car and increase this gap on the side rails here you need to do it in conditions where there's enough grip in the track for the rear tires to hang on so if you if you're running in quite low traction, low grip, if you if you have too much gap here, as soon as you hit the gas, your tires aren't going to be able to kind of hang on to the hang on to the track, and and you'll get a lot of slide and and possibly wheel spin, and the car will feel very loose uh, on the back end. So just be careful when you're playing around with this. Don't go too far too quickly. Um, are on the side of caution, I would say. Um, but as you as you play around with this more and more, you'll get a feel for the magnitude of the effect that it has on the car. Um, so yeah, I ended up with about 2.4 millimeters of gap under here. Um, in conjunction with making this change, obviously 
if I'm preloading the outer side rails of the chassis, it lifts the battery tray up relative to the outer chassis. So that affects the droop setting on the car. So if you're changing your side rail settings here, you also need to be mindful that you might have to adjust the, the droop or reset the droop on the car. Um, similarly to the front end, we, we tend to run quite a small amount of droop on the back of, it, of this car. I think because all of the weight is along the center line, um, you get a lot of longitudinal weight transfer naturally in the car. There's less lateral weight transfer. So the car's quite softly sprung on the corners um, because there's not as much lateral weight transfer. But if you're getting more front to back weight transfer, you can limit the effect of that by running less droop, particularly on the back of the car. So we're probably running half a millimeter of droop on the rear, possibly not even that much. Um, you set the droop with the with this set screw in the uh, damper on the underside here, um, and it's it's difficult to actually measure and get a value for the droop um, because you you need to be able to measure the ride height of this damper here, um, which is quite difficult to access with the outer chassis and the motor in the way. So what we've, what we've been tending to do in the UK is just set the car, set it up for the ride height you want, the side rail preload you want, tyres fitted, battery in the car, ready to race. Just put it on your setup board and then just lift the outer wings here. And if I do that, you should hear a tapping noise. So that tapping noise is just as I lift the wings up, the, um, the droop screw or the set screw in the damper is just tapping on the crossbar on the back of the pod. So that implies that there's a, a very small gap in there when the car is just settled. Um, which suggests that there's a very small amount of droop. So if I had to lift that, lift this battery tray up further um, before I engage the set screw on the on the cross brace, that would imply I'm running more droop. So um, it's quite an easy, quick check to make, just to make sure you've got some droop in the car, um, just to lift the outer, outer wings like this and hear that tapping noise. Um, again, with this set screw, small adjustments can make a big difference. So kind of go in one eighth or one quarter turn increments. Um, very fine adjustment just to, to get it how you want it. Um, and I guess the last thing really to mention is uh, the damper at the back of the car. So uh, the, when I raced previously at uh, MB models a few weeks ago, um, I, I think I made a mistake with the, the rear damper. I ran it too light, um, which made the car very edgy and nervous. Um, it was kind of initiating roll too quickly on corner entries, um, made it very difficult to drive, and it, it gave the sensation of having too much steering in the car. But I think having thought about it, the problem I had was it, the car didn't have too much steering. It was just very unstable on the rear end which made it feel like it had too much front end. So um, what I decided to do for Millet's this weekend is just go a little bit heavier on my rear damper. Um, I built this with 50K uh, silicon uh, in here. Um, and it to, to feel when I just rolled the car like this on, on the bench, it did felt like it was heavier on damping than, than what I'd run at MB Models a couple of weeks ago. So um, I was fairly confident that that I was in the right ballpark with that um, and it turned out to be pretty good um, and that's about it that's all I really changed from what we have as base setup on the car um, it ran really well particularly uh, as the grip was coming up in the carpet the car came alive more and more with each run I got quicker with each run more consistent um, and yeah had a, had a nice nice cruise in the final managed to take the win um, and it was also good to see there's some other automatics drivers there. So um, it's quite a small driver stand at Millet's. So they only have four or five uh, cars in a heat. We had uh, four of us in the A final and all four of us were driving automatics A12. So that was really great to see. Um, I went down there with uh, Mark Payne, who's one of the UK team drivers. Um, and we sat and... Had a nice social and helped out a couple of other guys running the car. Uh, I think they uh, felt as though they improved their times and improved their setups during the day. So that was that was great to see.